Welcome to the RCA's A to Z of the organ. Today's letter is O for ornamentation, and specifically I'm going to talk to you about playing ornaments in Bach. I'm not going to make it a comprehensive guide, neither am I going to tell you where to play them, but I'm going to select just three and give you a basic guide as to how we interpret those ornaments. Bach's ornamentation changed significantly over the course of his lifetime as he gained more and more diverse experience. Indeed, he lived at the culmination of an era which was fairly complex as far as the inheritance of the tradition of ornamentation was concerned. Near the beginning of his life, he absorbed much of it from the North Germans, and we know from the recently discovered Weimar organ tablature that his ornamentation began under the influence of people such as Kunau, who was the principal musician in Lutheran Germany in 1700. He then experienced the influence of the composers in the north, such as Bruns and Böhm, and later Buxtehude, of course. When Bach got to Weimar in 1708, he began to copy the ornament tables of the French harpsichordists as Dongelbert, Boivin and Raison. So at that time he based his ornamentation on those ornament tables. So of course Weimar was the time when he composed most of his organ music according to his children. So I'm going to talk to you about these three ornaments. The first is the Prautrell, it simply means a full trill as opposed to a simple appoggiatura. The Trillo Longo, the longer trill, and the mordant. So some general principles about ornamentation. Ornaments must always flow from the melodic line. They must never be heard as though they were an appendage or something extraneous. Bach, of course, was a violinist and thought of much of his ornamentation in terms of the violin. If you play one of his ornamental settings, such as BWV 659, Nun komm der Heiden Highland, play it in terms of the organ by all means, but then play it listening to the ornamental line as though it were being played on the violin. Everything we hear when we play Bach's ornamental preludes must be done in this way. So how we think of a Baroque ornament can be broken down into four parts. There's the commencement, the beginning of the trill, the corps, or the main body of the trill, the point d'arrêt, the point where you stop, and the termination, the termination, the last notes of it. So beginning, middle, point where you stop, and termination. All Baroque trills can be broken down into those four basic ingredients. So if we think first of all of the basic Proud trill, we have the commencement as the first note, the main part of the trill, the point d'arrêt on the note itself, and the termination perhaps could actually fall in. So the whole thing is... That's all it needs to be. Rapid, but not uncontrolled. Bach often actually writes this out in the notes of the music. Nowhere more clearly than at the end of the fugue in D minor from the second book of the 48 Preludes and Fugues. The concept of the trill beginning slowly is of critical importance. It should not begin with a crushed note. This indeed appeared later in the 18th century and was adopted by the French harpsichordist Van der Landowska. It's an attractive Rococo ornament, but it has no place in the music of Bach. I'm referring to this with the first note almost inaudible. It can become very untidy very quickly. The trillo longo is simply a long extension of the prowl trill. It begins slowly in measured notes, accelerates, flies, and suddenly stops on the point d'arrêt. And the termination is contextual. The simple mordant is a great deal easier to think of. The commencement is on the first note, the main part of the trill is the second note, and the point d'arrêt and termination happen together on the last note. So it is simply really very easy. 
That was not the only form of the mordant that existed in Bach's day. Indeed, if we look to the earliest years of his life and to the last years of his life, we'll see commentators saying that there could be multiple oscillations. If we decide to go back as far as Pretorius, there could be as many oscillations as you like. Marpo said in the 1740s that there could be three, and Murschhauser at the beginning of Bach's life said that there must be more than one. So if we wish to play Mordant, we'll do so. Or we can simply do the one Bach endorsed in his Explicatio for Wilhelm Friedemann, although never forget that that was written out when Friedemann was 10 years old, so it really is a basic beginner's guide. I'll just make two further points about the mordant. When he was in Weimar, Bach worked alongside his relative, Johann Gottfried Walter. In 1707, Walter wrote a treatise on composition in which he talks about the mordant. He divides it into two categories, the short and the long, and he explains that both begin on the lower auxiliary. So the short mordant would have been and the long mordant, perhaps more suited to the ornamental prelude. Finally, what I've said today really applies to the ornamental prelude. In more rapid tempi, the basic principles do still apply, but for instance, a proud trill may begin on the note itself. C.P. Bach referred to this as a half trill or a hunus mitten. Mordant works in the same way, upside down. So here now is a performance of the beginning of Erbarm dich mein, O Herr Gott, wie der Mühe 721, played on the organ of the Wenzelkirche in Naumburg, applying some of the principles that I've talked about today. Thank you, and look out for the next video in this series, The Letter P. Mm -hmm.